Structural Components, Part 1, Introduction. Using a case study test building outfitted with non-structural components and systems and constructed at the National Science Foundation Nice Shake Table Facility at the University of California, San Diego. Objective 1 to provide an introduction to the different types of loads that a structure must be able to carry. Objective 2. To describe the various structural components that are used in conventional building construction. Objective 3. To introduce the idea of load continuity and underline its importance in building design. Objective 4. To explain several important terms in building construction and highlight their importance relative to structural components steel reinforcing bars, rebar cages, reinforced concrete, concrete curing. Typical foundation structures are built below ground. Because this experiment was conducted on a shake table, the foundation was constructed above ground. Therefore, some differences from conventional foundation construction practices will be highlighted in this video. One of the most apparent differences between the five-story building case study and footing construction in conventional buildings is that the test building was constructed directly on a shake table, also called a steel platen, rather than on the ground. This table, found at UCSD, is an outdoor shake table with a one direction axial loading feature. Missing in this video is the initial step of excavating the earth in order to place the foundation into the ground. When constructing a specimen on a shake table, the test structure is cast directly only to the top of the steel platen requiring formwork to support the sidewalls of the foundation. In the field, however, shallow footings can make use of the natural sidewalls provided via the excavated earth. But, formwork in the field is required if the sidewall of the foundation extends above the natural grade or ground level. During the design of a building, engineers must first determine the types of loads that will be applied to the building, and in particular, have knowledge of where they are applied and their expected magnitude and direction. Once these are known, the building's structural system is analyzed under different load case combinations. The distribution of loads to structural components is a key step in the design process. Loads that are applied on structures can be divided into two general categories. Vertical loads, the most common of which are those induced by gravity, and lateral loads, which are often induced by wind or the inertial component of earthquakes. Vertical loads act in the up and down direction parallel to gravity. These gravity loads consist of the weight of the building itself, also known as the dead load, as well as the weight of other temporary components inside the building such as the occupants, equipment, furniture, and utilities. These temporary vertical loads are referred to as live loads. Lateral loads act in the direction that is parallel to the ground surface, i.e. horizontal, and as a result are applied horizontally to a building. Wind and seismic forces are two of the primary types of lateral loads that must be considered in the design of any structure. In some regions, wind loads may be more significant, while in others, the expected load due to an earthquake may be larger. Determining the lateral loads imposed on a structure has greater uncertainty, compared with estimating its gravity loads. Therefore, load combinations used to estimate the component loads may apply amplification factors or require larger margins of safety against failure due to lateral loads. To ensure that a building can withstand all loads imposed during a service lifetime, it is important that load case combinations include both vertical and lateral loads. The design and construction of large-scale structures requires the use of a number of different structural components, each of which must adequately carry the expected demands. Importantly, these components must be connected in such a way that the loads imposed on the structure can be transferred from component to component until they reach the ground. This concept of continual load transfer is referred to as load path continuity. The most common structural components can be generally categorized as columns, beams, shear walls, and floors. All of these elements fall within three general types, vertical elements, horizontal elements, or a combination of vertical and horizontal spanning elements. A column is a vertical element that helps transfer loads to other structural elements through compression. Thus, columns are strong members in the axial direction or along the length of the member. A beam element is capable of withstanding loads primarily by resisting bending or displacement perpendicular to its cross-section. 
These structural elements mainly carry vertical forces and transfer them to the connected columns. However, they certainly can be used to carry lateral loads due to earthquakes or wind. Vertical structural elements that are also used to withstand seismic or wind forces in the addition to gravity loads are shear walls. In general, shear walls are continuous elements spanning vertically from floor to floor. Although undesirable from a structural perspective, in select cases, shear walls may not be continuous up the height of the building. The nature of the distribution of shear walls across the floor plan of a building is often dictated by architectural and spatial layouts required of the occupancy. Shear walls are designed to resist lateral forces by carrying the applied loads in the plane of the wall along their length. Since they are typically much longer in the primary direction of loading, if well designed, shear walls have demonstrated good performance in high seismic or wind regions. In the general case of a building, the floors serve as horizontally spanning structural components that must transmit their loads to horizontally spanning beams. Often for buildings with large floors that span long distances, the floors are integrated with deep beams to create a horizontal diaphragm, which acts to transmit lateral forces to vertical resisting elements. The diaphragm assists the transferring lateral loads from the floor to the columns or shear walls. Although the primary role of the horizontal diaphragm in a structure is to provide lateral support against seismic and wind loads through their connection to the vertical elements at each floor level, they are also used to resist vertical loads. The vertical and lateral loads are transferred by individual structural components through the overall structural system of the foundation of the building. A path that describes the transfer of forces throughout the structure is called the load path. Load paths must be continuous, otherwise local instability within the structure could occur. In other words, every connection between the elements of the structure must be designed to transfer the applied loads from one element to the next until the loads reach the ground. Vertical load paths create compression in members and shear in connections. For example, the vertical dead load on a floor slab will be transferred onto the beams, subsequently to the walls and columns, and finally to the foundation which provides the direct transfer of loads to the ground. Lateral loads require shear walls and diaphragms to transfer the loads to the ground. Reinforcement is added to concrete to provide tensile resistance to the section. While concrete is very strong in compression, its resistance to tension loads is minimal. Steel reinforcing, in particular, has a much higher tensile strength and ductility than most other conventional building materials. Moreover, when placed within a concrete cross-section, its potential to degrade under environmental attack is minimized. Tensile strength is the maximum load a material can withstand while being stretched before reaching a catastrophic limit state, such as complete failure. In contrast, ductility characterizes the material's ability to deform under either a tensile or compressive stress. Steel is the preferred reinforcing material for concrete sections due to its high tensile strength and ductility as well as its ease of fabrication and placement. Moreover, following the placement of wet concrete, it hardens, a process termed curing, and undergoes thermal expansion. Steel experiences similar thermal expansive rates, and therefore the potential for buildup of internal stresses at the interface between these two materials is minimized. Steel is a preferred choice of metal used with concrete because when concrete is curing, it undergoes a thermal reaction that causes expansion. Steel experiences very similar thermal expansion as concrete and therefore eliminates the buildup of large internal stresses during the curing process. A satisfactory moisture content and temperature, preferably between 50 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit, must be maintained during the concrete curing process for quality concrete. In contrast to steel, however, as concrete hardens and hydrates, it gains strength. This hydration process can continue for long durations of time, however, is most rapid within the first few days following the pouring of wet concrete. Concrete that has been tested under pure compression following 28 days of curing typically demonstrates its attainment of at least 90% of its intended design strength. Another important feature of steel reinforcing used in conjunction with concrete is the well-developed bond that is provided between the two materials. This allows transfer of any stresses between the two materials to be efficient. Modern reinforcing steel is fabricated with deformations to facilitate even greater mechanical interlock between the two materials. However, one problem that the steel rebar can encounter over time is corrosion. Once the concrete is hardened fully, an alkaline environment is formed, which helps make the steel a lot more resistant to corrosion. 
The yield strength of steel reinforcing bars depends on the grade and its composition. The American Society for Testing and Materials, ASTM, has created a standard identification ruling that all rebars must comply with. Eleven standard sizes of reinforcing bars are in use today. In the Imperial system, they range from number 3 bars to number 18. These sizes refer to the fraction of an eighth of an inch in diameter of the bar. For example, a number 4 bar has a diameter of 4 eighths or 1 half of an inch. Structural Components Part 1 was an introduction to the different types of loads that a structure must be able to carry. It provided an insight on the various structural components that are used in conventional building construction. In addition, it introduced the idea of load continuity and its importance in building design. Finally, it explained several important building construction terminology as well as highlight important structural components such as steel reinforcing bars, rebar cages, reinforced concrete, and concrete curing. Structural Components Part 2 explains how the actual structural components such as columns, shear walls, beams, and floor slabs are installed during the construction process.